Welcome to episode four of The Roaring Trumpet, co-authored by L. Sprague de Camp and Fletcher Pratt. In episode three, our parallel world warlock, Harold Shea, embarked on a journey with the Norse gods, Loki and Thor, and the mortal Thialfi to find Thor's hammer. They traveled in Thor's chariot, which proved to be very challenging for Harold. First, one of the goats tried to pull the tunic off his body to eat it. Then the chariot took off without the two mortals. Thialfi easily jumped aboard in contrast to Harold falling on his face before he was successfully pulled over the tail by Theophy. He further lost face when he lost his breakfast over the side of the racing chariot as it sped 70 miles per hour on a rough, rutted track. When they stopped to camp, Shea failed to make a fire with his 20th century matches and he discovered that even his memory of the alphabet has been tampered with when he can't read the Boy Scout Manual, his reference book for strong magical formulas. With the gods, Shea meets his first giant named Screamer, who, while being unkempt and uncouth, seems quite courteous and friendly. Loki manipulates the situation with his silver tongue and gets the party invited to Utgarda Loki's big feed for all the giants, where the gods suspect Thor's hammer is being held. The party sets off in the chariot again with Screamer in the lead as their guide. Harold, even after his transference, still has his modern 20th century logical mind to analyze the situation he finds himself in. A contradiction dawns upon him when he questions that his clothes are thoroughly wet even after spending the night inside the shelter of the giant's glove. Harold Shea is played by Ray while Shea's inner thoughts are read by K, Thialfi, the servant of the gods, and Utgarda Loki, the chief of the giants, is read by Dan, Thor, the red beard, by Tom, Loki and a dwarf, by Sandy, Screamer, by Bill, Hoogie, by Ray, Logi, the son of Utgarda Loki, and also the Norse god Heimdall are played by Scott, the crone named Ellie played by Marvet, and our narrator is Galen. Let's join Harold now on his adventure with the gods as he wakes up to the power of magic and illusion in the land of the giants in episode four of The Roaring Trumpet. The rain had ceased. Ragged serpents of mist, pearly against the darker gray of the clouds, crawled over the hills. Outside, the travelers looked back at their shelter. There was no question that it was an enormous glove. Screamer grasped the upper edge of the opening with his left hand and thrust the right into the erstwhile dwelling. From where he stood, Shea couldn't see whether the big glove had shrunk to fit or whether it had faded out of sight and been replaced by a smaller one. At the same time, he became suddenly conscious of the fact that he was wet to the skin. Before he had a chance to think over the meaning of these facts, Thor was bellowing at him to help get the chariot loaded. When I was sitting hunched up on the chest and swaying to the movement of the cart, Theophi murmured to me, I knew Loki would get around the hairy one, 
When it's something that calls for smartness, he can depend on Uncle Fox, I always say. Shane nodded silently and sneezed. He'd be lucky if he didn't come down with a first-class cold riding in these wet garments. The landscape was wilder and bleaker around them than even on the previous day's journey. Ahead, Screamier tramped along, the bag on his back swaying with his strides, his sour sweat smell wafting back over the chariot. Wet garments? Why? The rain had stopped when we emerged from that monstrous glove. There was something peculiar about the whole business of that glove. The others, including the two gods, had unhesitatingly accepted its huge size as an indication that Screamer was even larger and more powerful than he seemed. He was undoubtedly a giant, but hardly that much of a giant. I suppose that although the world he was in did not respond to the natural laws of that from which he had come, there was no reason to conceive that the laws of illusion had changed. I had studied psychology enough to know something of the standard methods used by stage magicians, but others, unfamiliar both with which methods and technique of modern thought, would not think of criticizing observation with pure logic. For that matter, they would not think of questioning the evidence of observation. You know, I just wonder whether Loki is as clever as he thinks, and whether Screamier isn't smarter than he pretends. The servant of gods gave him a startled glance. A mighty strange word is that. Why? Well, didn't you say the giants would be fighting against the gods when this big smash comes? Truly, I did. High blows Heimdall, the horn is aloft, the ash shall shake, and the rhyme giants ride on the roads of hell. Leastways, that's what Folispa says, the words of the prophetess. Then isn't Screamer a shade too friendly with someone he's going to fight? Ha! Ah. You don't know much about Okuthior to say that. The Screamer may be big, but Redbeard had his strength belt on. He could twist that there giant right up. Snip snap. She tried once more. Uh, well, look here. Did you notice that when Screamer put his gloves on, your clothes got wet all of a sudden? Why, yes, now that I think of it. My idea is that there wasn't any giant glove there at all. It was an illusion, a magic to scare us. We really slept in the open without knowing it and got soaked. But whoever magicked us did a good job, so we didn't feel the wet till the spell was off and the big glove disappeared. Maybe so, but how does it signify? It signifies that Screamer didn't blunder into us by accident. It was a put-up job. The rustic scratched his head in puzzlement. Seems to me you're being a little might fancy, friend Harald. He looked around. I wish we had Heimdall along. He can see a hundred leaves in the dark and hear the wool growing on the sheep's back. But it wouldn't do to have him and Uncle Fox together. Thor's the only one of the Aesir that can stand, Uncle Fox. She shivered. Say, friend Harald, how would you like to run a few steps to warm up? I soon learned that Theophi's idea of warming up did not consist merely of dog trotting behind the chariot. We'll race to yonder boulder and back to the chariot. Be ready. Get set. Go. Before I fairly got into my stride, my woolens flapping around me, Theophi was halfway to the boulder, gravel flying under his shoes and clothes fluttering stiffly behind him like a flag in a gale. I had not covered half the distance when Theophi passed me, grinning 
on the way back. I had always considered myself a good runner, but against this human antelope, it was no contest. Wasn't there anything in which I could hold my own against these people? He only helped pull him over the tail of the chariot. You do a little better than most runners, friend Harald. But I thought I'd give you a little surprise, seeing as how maybe you hadn't heard about my running. But don't let Uncle Fox get you into any contests. He'll make a wager and collect it out of your hide. You got to watch him that way. Well, what's Loki's game anyway? I heard Heimdall suggesting he might be on the other side at the big fight. We all be shrugged. That there child of fury gets a little mite hasty about Loki. I guess he'll turn up on the right side all right. But he's a queer one. Always up to something. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. And he won't let anyone boss him. There's a lay about him, the Loka Senna, you know? I say to the gods and the sons of gods, the things that wet my thoughts. By the wells of the world, there is none with the might to make me do his will. That agreed fairly well with the opinion I had formed of the enigmatic Uncle Fox. I would have liked to discuss the matter with the Alfi, but I found that while I could form such concepts as delayed adolescence, superego, and sadism readily enough, I could think of no words to express them. If I wanted to be a practicing psychologist, in this world, I would have to invent a whole terminology for the science. He sneezed some more. He was catching cold. His nose clogged and his eyes ran. The temperature was going down and an icy breeze had risen that did nothing to add to his happiness. They lunched without stopping as they had on the previous day. As the puddles of the thaw began to develop crystals, and the chariot wheels began to crunch. Shea blew on his mittens and slapped himself. Thialfi looked sympathetic. Be really cold, friend Harald? This is barely freezing. A few years back, we had a winter so cold that when we made a fire in the open, flames froze solid. I broke off some pieces, and for the rest of the winter, whenever we wanted a fire, I used one of them pieces to light it with. Would have come in mighty handy this morning. My Uncle Einar traded off some as amber. It was told with so straight a countenance that Shea was not quite certain he was being kidded. In this world, it might happen. The terrible afternoon finally waned. Screamir was walking with head up now, looking around him. The giant waved toward a black spot on the side of the hill. Hey, you, there's a cave. Why you say we camp in there, huh? Thor looked around. It is not too dark for more of progress. Not untrue, powerful one. Yet I fear our warlock must soon freeze to an ice bone. We should have to pack him in boughs, lest pieces chip off. <laughs> oh, don't bide me. I can stand it. Perhaps I could. At least, if they went on, I wouldn't have to manhandle that chest halfway up the hill. He was overruled, but after all, did not have to carry the chest. When the chariot had been parked at the edge of a snowdrift, Screamir took that bulky object under one arm and led the way up the stony slope to the cave mouth. Could you get us fire? Sure thing, buddy. Screamir strode down to a clump of small trees, pulled up a couple by the roots, and breaking them across his knee, laid them for burning. Shea put his head into the cave. At first, he was conscious of nothing but the rocky gloom. Then he sniffed. He hadn't been able to smell anything, not even Screamir, for some hours, and now an odor picked through the veil of his cold. A familiar odor. Chlorine gas. What? Hey, you! Get she the hell out of my way! 
Jay got. Screamer put his head down and whistled. At least he did what would have been called a whistle in a human being. From his lips, it sounded more like an air raid warning. A little man, about three feet tall, with a beard that made him look like a miniature Santa Claus, appeared at the mouth of the cave. He had a pointed hood, and the tail of his beard was tucked into his belt. Hey, you! Let's have some fire. Make it snappy. He pointed to the pile of logs and brush in front of the cave mouth. Yes, sir. The dwarf toddled over to the pile and produced a coppery-looking bar out of his jacket. Shay watched the process with interest. But just then, Loki tucked an icicle down his back, and when Shay had extracted it, the fire was already burning with a hiss of damp wood. The dwarf spoke up in a little chirping voice. You are not planning to camp here, are you? Yeah, now beat it. Oh, but you must not. Start out. We camp where we damn please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Anything else, sir? No. Go on. Feed it before I step on you. The dwarf vanished into the cave. They got their belongings out and disposed themselves around the fire, which took a long time to grow. The setting sun broke through the clouds for a minute and smeared them with streaks of lurid vermilion. To Shay's imagination, the clouds took on the form of apocalyptic monsters. Far in the distance, he heard the cry of a wolf. The Alfie looked up suddenly, frowning. What's that noise? What noise? Then Thor jumped up. He had been sitting with his back to the cave mouth and spun around. Hey, clever one. Our cave is already not untenanted. He backed away slowly. From the depths of the cave, there came a hiss like that of a steam pipe leak, followed by a harsh, metallic cry. A dragon. A puff of yellow gas from the cave set them all coughing. A scrape of scales, a rattle of loose stones, and in the dark, a pair of yellow eyes the size of dinner plates caught the reflection of the fire. A seer, giant, and Theolfi shouted incoherently, grabbing for whatever might serve as a weapon. Here, I can take care of him. Shay had forgotten his previous reasoning. He pulled out the revolver. As the great snake-like head came into view in the firelight, he aimed at one of the eyes and pulled the trigger. The hammer clicked harmlessly. He tried again and again, click, click. The jaws came open with a reek of chlorine. Harold Shay stumbled back. There was a flash of movement past his head. The butt end of a young tree, wielded by Scrimir, swished down on the beast's head. The eyes rolled. The head half turned toward the giant. Thor leaped in with a roaring yell and let fly a right hook that would have demolished Joe Lewis. There was a crunch of snapping bones. The fist sank right into the reptile's face. With a scream like that of a disemboweled horse, the head vanished into the cave. Theolfi helped Shay up. Now maybe you can see why Screamer would as leaf not take chances with the Lord of the Goats. Heh, <laughs> that there dragon's going to have him a toothache next spring, if there is any spring before the time. The dwarf popped out again. Hey, Screamer. Oh. I tried to warn you that a fire would bring the dragon out of hibernation. But you wouldn't listen. Think you're smart, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The vest pocket Santa Claus capered in the mouth of the cave for an instant, thumbing his nose with both hands. He vanished as Screamier picked up a stone to throw. The giant lumbered over to the cave and felt around inside. Never catch the little two dogs now. They have burrows all through these hills. The evening's meal was eaten in silence, made more pointed for Shay by the fact that he felt it was mostly directed at himself. He ought to have known better, he told himself bitterly. 
In fact, I ought to have known better than to embark on such an expedition at all. Adventure, romance, bosh. As for the dream girl whose fancied image I had once in a rash moment described to Walter Bayard, those I had seen in this miserable dump were like lady wrestlers. If I could have used the formulas to return instantly, I would, but I could not. That was the point. The formulas didn't exist anymore, as far as I was concerned. Nothing existed but the bleak, snow-bound hillside, the nauseating giant, the two a seer and their servant regarding me with aversion. There was nothing I could do. Whoa, Shay, steady. You're talking to yourself and into a state of melancholy, which is, as Chalmers once remarked, of no philosophical or practical value. Too bad old Doc wasn't along to furnish a mature intellect in a civilized company. The intelligent thing to do was not to bemoan the past, but to live in the present. I lacked the physical equipment to imitate Thor's forthright approach to problems, but I could at least come somewhere near Loki's sardonic and intelligent humor. And speaking of intelligence, had I not already decided to make use of it in discovering the laws of this world, laws which these people were not fitted by their mental habit to deduce? He turned suddenly and asked Grimir, Didn't that dwarf say the fire fetched the dragon out of hibernation? Yeah, what about it, Slotty? The fire's still here. What if he or another one comes back during the night? Probably eat ya. And serve you right. <laughs> the niggling speaks sooth. It were best to move our camp. The accent of contempt in the voice made Shay wince. But he went on. We don't have to do that, do we, sir? It's freezing now and getting colder. If we take some of that snow and stuff it into the cave, it seems to me the dragon would hardly come out across it. Loki slapped a knee. Soundly and well said, turnip man. Now you and Theolfi shall do it. I perceive you are not altogether without your uses since there has been a certain gain in wit since you joined our party. Who would have thought of stopping a dragon with snow? <clears throat> when Shay awoke, he was still sniffling, but at least his head was of normal weight. He wondered whether the chlorine he had inhaled the previous evening might not have helped the cold, or whether the improvement was a general one based on his determination to accept his surroundings and make the most of them. After breakfast, they set out as before, Screamir tramping on ahead. The sky was the color of old lead. The wind was keen, rattling the branches of the scrubby trees and whirling an occasional snowflake before it. The goats slipped on patches of frozen slush, plodding uphill most of the time. The hills were all about them now, rising steadily and with more vegetation mostly pine and spruce. It must have been around noon, Shay could only guess at the time, when Screamir turned and waved at the biggest mountain they had yet seen. The wind carried away the giant's words, but Thor seemed to have understood. The goats quickened their pace toward the mountain, whose top hung in cloud. After a good hour of climbing, I began to get glimpses of a shape looming from the bare crest, intermittently blotted out by the eddies of mist. When they were close enough to see it plainly, it became clearly a house, not unlike that of the Bonder Sphere, but it was cruder, made of logs with the bark on, and vastly bigger, 
as big as a metropolitan railroad terminal. Thialfi said into his ear, That will be Utgard Castle. You'll need whatever might of courage you have here, friend Harald. The young man's teeth were chattering from something other than cold. Skrymir lurched up to the door and pounded on it with his fist. He stood there for a long minute, the wind flapping his furs. A rectangular hole opened in the door. The door swung open. The chariot riders climbed down, stretching their stiff muscles as they followed their guide. The door banged shut behind them. They were in a dark vestibule, like that in Sphere's house, but larger and foul with the odor of unwashed giant. A huge arm pushed the leather curtain aside, revealing through a triangular opening a view of yellow flames and thronging, shouting giants. Keep your eyes open, Harald. As the old of Vivin says, all the gateways are one goes out, thoughtfully should a man scan. Uncertain it is where the sits the unfriendly upon the bench before thee. Within the place was a disorderly parody of spheres. Of the same general form with the same benches, its tables were all uneven, filthy, and littered with fragments of food. The fire in the center hung a pall of smoke under the rafters. The dirty straw on the floor was thick about the ankles. The benches in the passageway behind them were filled with giants, drinking, eating, shouting at the tops of their voices. Before him, a group of six with iron gray top knots and patchy beards like screamers were wrangling. One drew back his arm in anger. His elbow struck a mug of mead borne by a harassed looking man who was evidently a thrall. The mead splashed onto another giant who instantly snatched up a bowl of stew from the table and slammed it on the man's head. Down went the man with a squeal. Screamier calmly kicked him from the path of his guests. The six giants burst into bubbling laughter, rolling in their seats and clapping each other on the back, their argument forgotten. Hey, screw and bowler. Screamier was gripping another giant on the bench by the arm. How's every little thing with you? Come here. I want you to meet a friend of mine. This here goes as the Thor. Scrid Baldnir turned. She noticed that he was slenderer than Screamir with ash blonde hair, the pink eyes of an albino, and a long red ulcerated nose. He's a frost giant, and that gang over there are fire giants. He waved a trembling hand toward the other side of the table, where a group of individuals like taller and straighter gorillas were howling at each other. They were shorter than the other giants, but much more than eight feet tall. They had prognathous jaws and coarse black hair where their bodies were exposed. They scratched ceaselessly. Halfway down the hall at one side sat the biggest hill giant of all in a huge chair with interwoven serpents carved on the legs and arms. His costume was distinguished from those of the other giants in that the bone skewers through his top nut had rough gold knobs on their ends. One of his lower snag teeth projected for several inches beyond his upper lip. He looked at Screamier. Hey, bud. I see you got some kids, which uh, it ain't a good idea to bring kids to these feeds. They learns bad language. They ain't kids. There are a couple of men and a couple of Aesir. I told them they could come with me. Uh, that okay, boss? Utgar Loki picked his nose and wiped his fingers on his greasy leather jacket before replying. I guess so. But ain't that one with the red whiskers, Asa Thor? You are not mistaken. <laughs> well, well, you don't say so. I always thought Thor was a big husky guy. Thor stuck out his chest, scowling. It is ill to jest with the Asir giant. Ha <laughs> ha, ain't he the cutest little fella? 
Utgard Loki paused to capture a small creeping thing that had crawled out of his left eyebrow and crack it between his teeth. Loki murmured in Shay's ear. A fair arrangement. They live on him. He lives on them. But what you doing here, you? This is a respectable party, see? And I don't want no trouble. I have come for my hammer, Mjolnir. Huh? What well, makes you think we got it? Ask not of the tree where it got its growth, or of the gods their wisdom. Will you give it up, or do I have to fight you for it? Ah, oh, don't be like that, Oku Thor. Sure, I'd give you your piddling nutcracker if I knew where it was. Nutcracker? Why, you? Easy, son of Odin. With the strong use strength, with the liar lies. He turned to Utgard Loki and bowed mockingly. Chief of Giants, we thank you for your courtesy and will not trouble you long. Trusting your word, Lord, are we to understand that Mjolnir is not here? Tain't here as far as I know. Utgard Loki spit on the floor and rubbed his bare foot over the spot with just a hint of uneasiness. Might it not have been brought hither without your knowledge? Utgard Loki shrugged. How in hell should I know? I said as far as I knew. This is a hell of a way to come at your host. Evidently, there is no objection should the desire come upon us to search the place. Ah, uh, you're damn right there's objections. This is my joint, and I don't let no foreigners go sniffing around. Loki smiled ingratiatingly. Greatest of the Jotun, your objection is but natural with one who knows his own value. But the gods do not idly speak. We believe Molnir is here and have come in peace to ask it, rather than in arms with Odin and his spear at our head, Heimdall and his great sword, and Ullr's deadly bow. Now you shall let us search for the hammer, or we will go away and return with them to make you such a feasting as you will not soon forget. But if we fail to find it, we will depart in all peace. This is my word. And mine. Beside him, Shay noticed Thialfi's face go the color of skimmed milk and was slightly surprised to find himself unafraid. But that may be because I don't understand the situation. Utgard Loki scratched thoughtfully, his lips working. Tell you what, you ace here are sporting gents, ain't ya? It is not to be denied that we enjoy sports. I'll make you a sporting proposition. You think you are great athletes. Well, we got pretty tough babies here, too. We'll have some games. And if you beat us at even one of them, see, I'll let you go ahead and search. If you lose, out you get. What manner of games? Hell, Sonny, anything you want. Thor's face had gone thoughtful. I am not unknown as a wrestler. All right. We'll find someone to wrestle you down. Can you do anything else? I will meet your best champion at eating, and our man Theolfi here will run a race with you. Asa Thor also will undertake any trial of strength you care to hold. Swell. Me, I think these games are kid stuff, see? But it ought to be fun for some of the gang to see you take your licking. Hi, bring Ellie up here. 
Here's a punk that wants to wrestle. With a good deal of shouting and confusion, a space was cleared near the fire in the center of the hall. Thor stood with fists on hips, waiting the giant's champion. There came forward, not a giant, but a tall old woman. She was at least a hundred, a hunched bag of bones covered by thin, almost transparent skin, as wrinkled as the surface of a file. What manner of jest is this, Utgarda Loki? It is not to be said that Asa Thor wrestles with women. Oh, don't worry, nun kid. She likes it, don't you, Ellie? The crone bared toothless gums. Yep. And many's the good man I put down, hey, hey. But... You ain't scared to work up a reputation, are you? Ha, huh. Thor, afraid? Not of aught the giant kindred can do. Thor puffed out his chest. I gotta explain the rules. Utgard Loki put a hand on the shoulder of each contestant and muttered at them. I felt my arm pinched and looked into the bright eyes of Loki. Great and evil is the magic in this place, and I misdoubt me we are to be tricked, for never have I heard of such a wrestling. But it may be that the spells they use are spells against gods alone, and not for the eyes of men. Now I have here a spell against spells, and while these contests go forward, you shall take it. He handed me a piece of very thin parchment, covered with spidery runic writing. Repeat it forward, then backward, then forward again, looking as you do at the object you suspect of being an illusion. It may be you will see on the wall the hammer we seek. Wouldn't the giants hide it away, sir? Not with their boasting and vainglorious habit, it... All right. Go. Thor, roaring like a lion, seized Ellie as though he intended to dash her brains out on the floor. But Ellie might have been nailed where she was. Her rickety frame did not budge. Thor fell silent, wrenching at the crone's arms and body. He turned purple in the face from the effort. The giants around murmured appreciatively. I glanced at the slip Loki had given me. The words were readable, though they seemed to consist of meaningless strings of syllables. Nai ye, ni di, nor dri, su dri, ostri, vetri, aljof davelin. I obediently repeated it according to the directions, looking at a giant's club that hung on the wall. It remained a giant's club. I turned back to the wrestling where Thor was puffing with effort, his forehead beaded with sweat. Which? Thor seized her arm to twist it. Ellie caught his neck with her free hand. There was a second scuffle, and Thor skidded away, falling to one knee. That's enough. Utgard Loki stepped between them. That counts as a fall. Ellie wins. I guess it's a good job you didn't try to wrestle with any of the big guys here. Hey, Thor, old kid. The other giants roared in approval that drowned Thor's growl. All right, you, stand back. Get back, I say, or I'll cut the blood eagle on a couple of you. Next event's an eating contest. Bring Logie up here. We got some eating for him to do. A fire giant shuffled through the press. His black hair had a reddish tinge, and his movements were quick and animal-like. Is it lunchtime yet? Them three elk I ate for breakfast just kind of got my appetite going. 
Utgard Loki explained and introduced him to his opponent. Pleased to meet you. I always like to see a guy what appreciates good food. Say, you ought to come down to Muspelheim sometime. We got a cook what knows how to roast a whale right. He uses charcoal fire and bastes it with bear grease. That'll do, Logie. You get that guy talking about the meals he's at, and he'll talk till the time comes. Shea was pushed back by giants as they crowded in. An eddy of the crowd carried him still farther away from the scene of action as the giants made way for a little procession of harried-looking slaves. These bore two huge wooden platters, on each of which rested an entire roast elk haunch. Shea stood on tiptoe and stretched. Between a pair of massive shoulders, he glimpsed Utgard Loki taking his place at the middle of the long table, at each end of which sat one of the contestants. His shoulder moved across Shea's field of vision, and he glanced up at the owner. It was a comparatively short giant who bulged out in the middle to make up for his lack of stature. A disorderly mop of black and white hair covered his head. But the thing that struck Shea was that the, as the giant turned profile to watch the eaters, the eye that looked from under the palbite thatch was bright blue. That was wrong. Fire giants, as I had noted, had black eyes. Hill giants, gray or black eyes. Frost giants, pink. Of course, this giant might have a trace of some other blood. But there was a familiar angle to that long, high bridge nose and something phony looking about the mop of hair. Heimdall. She whispered behind his hand. How many mothers do you have, giant with the uncombed thatch? Huh. Thrice three, man from an unknown world. But there's no need to shout. I can hear your lightest whisper, even your thoughts half-formed. I think we're being tricked. He didn't say it even in a whisper this time, merely thought it, moving his lips. The answer was pat. That is what was to be expected, and for no other reason did I come hither. Yet I have not solved the nature of the spells. I have been taught a spell. He remembered Heimdall's enmity to Loki and all his works just in time to keep from mentioning Uncle Fox. Which may be of use in such a case. Then use it while you watch the contest. All right. Ready, you two? Go. The giants gave a shout. With my eyes fixed on Loki, I was repeating, Nai Nidi. Nordri Sudri. The sly god bounced in his oversized chair as he applied his teeth to the elk haunch. The meat was disappearing in hunks the size of a man's fist at the rate of two hunks per second. I had never seen anything like it and wondered where Loki was putting it all. I heard Theophany's voice, thin in the basso profundo clamor of the giants. Be sit yourself, son of Laufe. Then the bone, the size of a baseball bat, was clean. Loki dropped it clattering to the platter and sat back with a sigh. A whoop went up from the assembled giants. I saw Loki start forward again, the eyes popping from his head. Ugarda Loki walked to the opposite end of the table. He bellowed. Logi wins. Shea turned to look at the other contestant, but his head bumped a giant's elbow so violently that he saw stars. His eyes beaded with tears. For one fleeting second, he saw no Logi there at all, only a great leaping flame at the opposite end of the table, a flicker. The teardrop was gone, and with it, the picture. Logie sat contentedly at the other end of the table, and Loki was shouting. Peace!
finished no sooner than myself. Yeah, sonny boy, but he at the bone and the platter, too. I said, Logie wins. Heimdall! Shea said it so loud that the god thrust a hand toward him. Fortunately, the uproar around drowned his voice. It is a trick, an illusion. Logi is a flame. Now, good luck. Go with your eyes, no warlock and warlock. Warn Asathor and use your spell on whatever you can see, for it is more than ever important that the hammer be found. Surely these tricks and slights must mean the time is even nearer than we think. And the giants are desirous not to see that weapon in the hands of Redbeard. Go. Utgard Loki, posted on the table where the eating contest had been held, was directing the clearing of a section of the hall. The next event is a foot race. You, shrimp. Utgard Loki pointed at the Alfi. You're going to run against my son, Hoogie. Where is that young half-wit? Hoogie. Here I am, Pop. A gangling adolescent giant wormed his way to the front. He had little forehead and less chin and a crop of pimples the size of poker chips. You want me to run against him? <laughs> Hoogie drooled down his chin as he laughed. Shay ducked and dodged, squeezing through toward Thor, who was frowning with concentration as he watched the preparations for the race. Thialfi and the drooling Kugi placed themselves at one end of the hall. Go! They raced for the far end of the hall, a good 300 yards away. Thialfi went like the wind, but Hugi went like a bullet. By the time Thialfi had reached the far end, his opponent was halfway back. Hoogie wins first heat. Utgard Loki roared above the tornado of sound. It's two out of three. The crowd loosened a little as the contestants caught their breath. Shea found himself beside Thor and Loki. Hey, turn up, Harold. Where have you been? It is more like anything else that he has been concealed under a table like a mouse. Shay was too full of his news to resent anything. They're trying to put tricks on you, on us. All of these contests are illusions. He could see Thor's lips curl. He growled angrily to Loki. Your warlock can see deeper into a millstone than most. No. But I mean it, really. Hoogie had just passed them to take his place for the second heat, the hall's huge central fire on the other side. Look, that runner of theirs, he cast no shadow. Thor glanced, and his comprehension spread across his features, turned purple. But just then, Utgard Loki cried, Go! And the second race was on. It was a repetition of the first. Utgard Loki announced over a delighted roar that Hoogie was the winner. Mm, I am to pick up their damned cat next. If that be another trick of theirs, I'll... Not so loudly. Soft and slow is the sly fox taken. Now, Thor, you shall try this cat lifting as though nothing were amiss. But Harald here, who is only half subject to their spells, because he is immortal and without fear, shall search for Mjolnir. Youngling, you are our hope and stay. Use, use the spell I gave you. End of episode four.